This is the completed artwork for my under pressure compressor pedal. This is the same pedal that I modeled previously in Google SketchUp and the enclosure that I drilled and painted in previous videos. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to prepare artwork like this and print it out onto inkjet water slide decal paper that you can then apply to the finished pedal. So I'm using GIMP, which is the GNU Image Manipulation Program. That's a free open source program for image and photo editing. It's a lot like Photoshop. It's got tons of features, so this won't be a comprehensive tutorial. I'll just take you through the process of making pedal art like what you see here and demonstrate the set of techniques that I use to get it done. So let's start by going through the components of this under pressure image. I've got a series of layers here, and the layers are laid out so that things that are higher on the list display over the top of the things that are lower on the list. So let me just break it down real quick. I'm going to hide everything and then show it again. So starting with emptiness, this is just transparency, I've drawn a solid white background over it. On top of that, I've pasted in this sort of flowing water image. And then here's my pressure gauge. Then I've erased around the, the edges and added this black rectangle to go around the edge to make a nice crisp edge. Then I've extended the needle here to point up to the top. Then I have a bunch of text, which is in a grouped set of layers. This is a layer group. And you can see there's individual text here in different fonts. And then lastly, I have a, a saved layer group that I used to get started. And that is the original drilling template that I printed from my Google SketchUp model. And I used that to begin with so that I would know where the holes would be drilled on the enclosure so I could see how it would fit together with the text labels and everything. I also pasted in a couple knobs here uh, from Google SketchUp just so I could see what size they would be when they were on the model. This is the artwork for another pedal I'm working on, my Speed Racer Overdrive. It's not quite finished yet, but let me take you through the layers as they are now. And uh, I'll start with the, the background waves. And this is partly based on this original Speed Racer artwork I found. And I trimmed off the background city and the mountain to end up with something like this. And his helmet and arm were cut off in the original image at the top of the page, so I copied part of his helmet and rotated it around so that it would look seamless. And then I drew in his arm freehand. It's going to be partially covered by a knob, so I didn't have to get too perfect with it. And then I changed him to be more black and white by adjusting the color levels on that layer. And then I added this semi-opaque white bar to highlight the text, which looks like this, and the drop shadows for the text, and then this nice rounded edge. Here's what it would look like with the knobs and lights. So that should just give you a little taste of the kind of thing you can make with GIMP. Of course, sky's the limit depending on how artistic you are or how much time you want to put into it. So let me walk you through the process starting from scratch. Let's create a new image with File, New. And the first thing you got to pick is the resolution of the image. Now I'm doing this in 600 dpi dots per inch, which is kind of overkill for the size of the printout we're doing, this little 2.5 by 4 inch pedal. But I found it better to err on the side of higher resolution rather than low. If your resolution is too low, I think the first one I did, I did in 72 dpi or 100 dpi, the printout ended up looking really fuzzy and jagged and, and not very good. So by picking a higher number here, I'm just sort of giving myself more headroom. So, you know, the overall file size will be pretty big. I think these uh, project files are about 50 megabytes a piece. And processing time for manipulating the image will be a little longer, take more CPU power. But the benefit is later on, you can blow this up to a bigger size if you need to. You can use it in print, add copy if you want. And, you know, if you were to start too low, you, you can't ever fix it. You can't get the pixels back because they were never there to begin with. So if you decide you want a nicer quality image, you're just going to have to start over from scratch. This way, you start out with a nice high resolution and you can shrink it down as necessary. The next thing to do is change the scale of this image size to inches and type in the actual size of the pedal. The one we're going to do is about two and a half inches wide by about four and three quarters and just say OK here. So that's created the new image for us, and it's filled it with the white background color. I'm just going to zoom it out so that we can see the whole thing. Now, this white color was based on the current background color, which this is this black is the foreground, and this is the, the background color. 
It's important to recognize that white, when you're printing on an inkjet printer, is the absence of color. There is no white ink, so anywhere that you leave as white will just not be drawn. And what you'll see instead is the color of the paint that you've painted the enclosure. So it's probably a good idea so that you can lay out your petal with a good idea of what it's actually going to look like in the end to create a layer here and fill it with the actual color that you're going to paint the, the petal. Let's say you're going to paint it some green color or something. So you pick the color here in the color picker, you say OK, and then you fill this layer with the foreground color. And there you go. Now, everything you do after this, you'll draw on top of that color. So GIMP will correctly anti-alias to that background color, and you'll be able to make good color choices that go well with your petal color. Of course, you'll be hiding this layer before you go to print so that you're not actually going to print this color onto the decal. Now my petal will be off-white, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that layer and just leave this white background. Now to get started with laying out your project, you know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can just simply draw on some text labels, uh, maybe put a couple lines on there, uh, or you can, you know, take it as far as you want it. I'm going to go ahead and start by bringing in the drilling template from Google SketchUp. So let's switch over to SketchUp, where I have my enclosure that I modeled previously. I'm going to zoom in to make it fill up the screen. Turn off anything you don't want in your little template here, like uh, maybe I'll turn off the jacks. And then File Export 2D Graphic. And I'll call it Enclosure. And I'm going to switch back to GIMP and open that image up in GIMP. So that's opened it up as a new image. And what I'm going to do is select around the edges of it using the rectangle tool and just grab the corners like this and drag it down. And I'm going to copy this into the clipboard with Control C or Edit Copy. Now I'm going to switch back to our new image and paste this as a new layer. Paste as new layer. Now there it is, and it's tiny because that exported image from SketchUp was in a much lower resolution than our petal art here but that's easy enough to fix. I'm just going to scale this up using Transform Tools, Scale, and make sure that this little chain is linked so it preserves the aspect ratio, and just drag the corner down until it fits. Now, this doesn't have to be perfect, and it doesn't have to look good because it's not going to be in our final artwork, but the whole point is that now that this is in here, we can place our text labels and things around this so that they're all in the right position. I just switched to the Move tool and dragged it over by about a pixel just to center it. Now, if you haven't modeled your enclosure in SketchUp, there's another way to do it. Let's turn off this layer by hiding it. You click on the eye there. And instead, you can lay out some guidelines and draw some circles yourself. So first off, make sure that the units of your rulers are in inches. Uh, you know, usually it starts out in pixels. You switch it to inches, and that way, you can draw a guideline just by clicking on the ruler and dragging down. And you can see that down in the lower left corner there, it's showing me uh, where I'm at. So I'm adding a guide. Let's say I've measured on my pedal and I know that my knob centers are one and a half inches down. So I just go down until this says 1.5, add guide, 1.5, and let go. And if I get it in the wrong place, I can just grab it and drag it. So there we go, 1.5. And then if I know that they're over, you know, a half an inch or something, I, or three quarters of an inch, let's say, I'll drag it into three quarters and let go. Same thing from the other side, working back. Two and a half minus three quarters is 1.75, so I drag it back to 1.75. And then that would be the positions that I draw my new circles. So let's draw a couple centered circles. Uh, let's change the foreground color to black. And... We're going to use the circle tool or the ellipse tool up here. And right now I've got the layers tab shown here. If I switch to this tab, this is the properties or whatever tool is currently selected. And what I want to do is make sure that expand from center is turned on and that it's a fixed aspect ratio one to one, which will make it a circle. Expand from center means as I click and drag, the circle will come out from where I clicked rather than clicking uh, and dragging from the top left. So what I'm going to do also is turn on View, Snap to Guides. And then I'm going to click at the intersection of these guides, and I'm just going to drag it out like this. And you can see down there I'm making a rectangle that's half by half, so let's say a half an inch. 
Actually, I think these knobs are more like three quarters. This is just a selection now. I want to actually draw a circle. So I need to select a layer to draw on. I'm going to make a new layer and call it knobs. And then edit stroke selection. And that is actually going to draw a line around the selection. And I'm going to stroke the line using a solid color. It uses the current foreground color, which is black, and make it six pixels wide. That's fine. Now that's drawn that line, I'm going to draw another one over here. Make it the uh, same size, about three quarters. And stroke the selection. Select none. Switch back to the marquee tool. You can turn off the guides by saying view, show guides off. And there they are. So that gives you an idea of how you would draw some things on for your own layout if you didn't have a drilling template to use. I'm going to go ahead and delete that layer since I already have my SketchUp image here. Turn that back on. Now we can draw some text on here, and we do that by selecting the text tool or hitting the letter T and just drawing a rectangle where we want the text. Now I'm going to show the tool options for the text tool here, and I'm going to change the font to Tahoma and amp the size up to about 110 pixels since we're a very high resolution image and I'm going to center it in the box. So now when I start typing, it's just going to be centered right under the knob there, since I made the rectangle about the same size as the knob. You can also alt-click and drag to move this thing around, so something like that. Okay, and then we'll draw a new rectangle here, and call it Sustain. Seems like this is a good time to save our work, so let's go ahead and say File, Save As, and I'll call it Test Petal. Now I was just using the standard Windows system font Tahoma here, but one way to make your pedal more unique is to use some non-standard fonts. Now there's a number of websites that have free fonts, like this one, Urban Fonts, and they have a whole bunch of categories of fonts with just hundreds and hundreds of fonts to choose from. You just kind of go through and, and look at them and download anything that you like the look of. Yeah, I like this, you know, bell-bottom laser. It's kind of a good 70s vibe, so I'm just going to download this. And then what's in the zip is a TTF, that's a true type font. And you can just double click on that, and that brings up the standard Windows font installer. You can see what it looks like, and you can install it. Now, I also recommend that if you're going to use this font in your project, that you copy the true type font file into your project folder so that later on, if you reinstall your system or move these files to another system, you'll be able to reinstall this font and be able to render your project correctly. If you're missing the font, you won't be able to draw the text anymore. Okay, so unfortunately this newly installed font will not show up in GIMP until we restart GIMP. Alright, I've restarted GIMP and reloaded our project, and now we should be able to go to the text tool and use the font that we've just installed. So up here I should be able to type in bell bottom, and there it comes right up. I pick a nice big size, like 240, and then just type something in. <laughs> there we go. Now we have our text done. Let's switch out of the text tool and go to the layers and turn off the knobs. Now we could just be done now. You know, you could just print this out and use it as your pedal art. Or you can fancy it up a bit if you want. If you're an artist and you have a tablet, you can do some painting right into GIMP. It's very, uh, very good with pressure sensitivity and brushes and things like that. Or you can take a photo and import it in and edit it to fit onto your image. Or you can go and import some art, for example, using the Google image search. Let me show you how to do that. Uh, on my under pressure pedal, I think I typed in pressure gauge to go find a bunch of pictures. So you can see Google gives you a whole bunch to choose from. And unfortunately, a lot of these images will be very low resolution and won't look good if you try to use it in your project. So what I'm going to do is go over to the filter here and click on large. And that will tell Google to only show me images that are higher resolution. And you can see there's a bunch of things here. If you hover your mouse over something, it shows you the size of it. See, this is 1600 by 1200. That's a reasonable size. Something like this would work fine. Um, this one looks all right. I think this one right here is the one I used. Now, if you find one you like, just click on it. and It'll bring it up. And you can see Google is telling you it's 1000 by 1000. I click on full size image. I can right click it and save it into my project folder. Or I can copy this image directly into the clipboard like this. So I click Copy Image, and then I'll switch back to GIMP and paste it in. Now I'm going to say Edit, Paste as New Layer. Now you can see that it's relatively small compared to the high resolution of our project. 
but hopefully it'll scale up okay. And we'll see if it does in just a second. First of all, I'm going to rename this to original pressure gauge. And then I'm going to duplicate this layer and hide the original. And that way, if I screw it up while I'm editing, I have a backup here. I'll just rename this one to pressure gauge. Okay, I'm gonna use the move tool, hit the letter M and drag this down here. And then I'm gonna use the scale tool and I'm gonna just drag the corners. Notice that the, the chain is locked so the aspect ratio is correct. And that looks good, let's just try that. Once again, I'm gonna move it and just sort of drag it down. Something like that. Now it doesn't look too bad. I think it scaled up okay. You can zoom in and check on it. And I think it's all right. So the next steps will be to do a little editing on it to make it look better and integrate better with our image. And that will involve erasing this gray background from it and maybe eliminating some of this text down here. I'm gonna go ahead and use the ellipse tool on this one and tell it to expand from the center and just drag out and see if I can match this roughly to the shape of this dial. Let's see, it looks like it's about there. Maybe drag in on this side a little bit. Um, and what I'm doing is just selecting around the edges so that I can then delete everything that's not in this circle. So if I hit the delete key right now, it'll do the wrong thing. It'll delete everything in the center, and that's not what I wanted. Instead, I want to invert the selection. So I say select, invert, and then hit delete, and you see that it's deleted everything outside that circle. So I'm going to switch out of the ellipse tool and see how we did. I'm going to say select none and switch to the background layer just so it gets rid of those dotted lines and take a look. Yeah, not bad. Now, on a more complex shape, it's not so easy. Let me give you an example. I'm going to drag in an image here of speed, the one I showed you earlier. And I want to get rid of everything in the background, the beach, the boats, the buildings, the water, the mountain, just leaving speed. So I could, for example, just pick the eraser tool and just go for it and start erasing stuff. But if I come back later and realize I made a little mistake like that, I accidentally cut out part of his shirt and I didn't notice it at the time that I was drawing or erasing, it's really hard to fix it because I would have to go back to the original image and copy paste it back in which is not a good way to work on an image of this complexity because you're gonna make mistakes while you're working on it. A better approach is to create what's called a layer mask. If I right click on the layer here and say add layer mask, just take the default white full opacity, you can see now that this layer area over here has two things in it. It's got the original image and a mask. If I click on the mask, I can draw onto the mask like this, the paintbrush, and Anything that's black on the mask will mask out that part of the layer and make it invisible. Whereas anything that's white on the mask, just reversing these colors here, will allow the original image to show through. So you can see as the default, it started out fully white. Everything was visible. But as I, as I drew black over it, I was erasing stuff. And this is a great way to work because if I make a mistake like I just did, I can put the white back on and I can fix it. Get back to the original image like that. So using a layer mask is a much more efficient way to work. Now let's take a look at some of the tools that you can use to do the erasing. I'll go ahead and undo those changes. Let's start with the free select tool. It looks like a little lasso. Now the way this works is you click and drag as a free form selection. And when you reach back to where you started, it makes a little orange dot and you let go and you have a selection there. Now because I've got the layer mask selected and my background color is black, if I hit the delete key, it'll fill that section with black on the mask, which will block it out. Now you can also use the lasso tool to make a more finely controlled selection. Let me zoom in down here. Now, if you click and release, you'll see an orange dot. And then you click again, each place you're clicking is making a point along the path. So you can see I can go along here and make a lot of points along a selection. And I can go back and adjust them if I want, like this. And I can get really meticulous and make a careful selection. And it doesn't actually make a selection until I go back and connect up with where I started. Now you see the dotted line. So if I delete here, you can see that I've cut out along the edge of his shirt and pants here. Let me pan down the image a little bit here by pressing the space bar and dragging the mouse down a bit. Now you can make the selection look a little better if you feather it. Let me go to the tool options here and turn on feather edges 
radius, uh, let's make it kind of small, like 5. Now if I uh, make a little selection down here, just like I did before, and then close it up, and delete this, it actually kind of softens the edge of the selection. Let me select all, you can kind of see the difference there. This one has a little bit of a, a rough edge to it, whereas this one sort of blends in nicely. Another tool is the Scissor Select tool. Now this tool is useful if your image has a high enough contrast between the foreground image that you want to keep and the background that you want to delete. And with this tool, you can select along the edge of an image and it will automatically sort of figure out where to go for you. But as you can see, it's having a bit of trouble here and it's partly because it's sort of a low resolution image and also because there's a lot of complexity here. So you end up having to do some adjustments and adding extra nodes. Now I just close the selection by clicking back on the Start node. You can see it really wants to go along that line there. I'm going to make a new node and drag it down here. And then you click inside it to make the selection. And then I hit the Delete key. Well, it turned out not bad. The feathering of the selection sure helped it smooth out those rough edges. But you see it got messed up here by this darker background area. There wasn't enough contrast between that and the edge of the glove. So in general, if I have a high contrast edge to work on, I'll start with the Scissors tool. And if it works out, then great but usually I end up switching back to the free select tool. Zooming out again now, let me just show you a couple other quick things. For roughing out larger scale areas, you can just use the rectangle tool like this and hit the delete key, or clear that selection and use the eraser, and you can rough out large areas real quick like this. Now we don't really need this image, so let me go ahead and close this and get back to our project. This is looking pretty good. Let me just show you a couple more things before we call it done. I'm going to zoom in on this text down here and show you how to get rid of this. First of all, I need to select the layer on which that appears. It's this pressure gauge layer. And I still have this eraser tool selected, but it's not the right tool. Check this out. See, it's just kind of blasting it through to the background color, which looks terrible. And even if I was to try to pick an appropriate shade of gray to fill it with, it wouldn't look right because it wouldn't match the other background area exactly. Instead, there's a couple things we can do. You can use a standard selection tool like the rectangle tool, select an area, and then feather it to soften its edges, and then just copy and paste it. So I hit Control C and Control V, and now I can just drag it over this area. And you can then use the Scale tool here to stretch it out. And you know, this won't be perfect, but it's not bad. Let me convert that to a layer and unselect it to get rid of the dotted lines. You know, it's okay, but you can see that there's sort of a hard corner up here. So you could try different amounts of feathering on the selection, or you could also try applying some blur filters to help smooth out those sharp corners. But there's a whole other approach, and let me show you this. This is called the Clone Tool. It looks like a stamp. And let me go ahead and undo what I did. And the Clone Tool has some options. First you select a brush, and instead of a hard round brush, I'm going to use a soft round brush like this one. And then I'm going to make it a little smaller, like maybe about 30. I also need to select the layer that has the image in it. Now the way this works is you press the control key and select an area that you wish to clone. And then that little circle stays there. And then you go down here and as I click and drag, you see they both sort of move around. Just do small little circles like this. And I'm cloning the area from up there to down here. And occasionally you want to relocate your source material. So I hit control again and click over here. And then drag some more like this. And you see it does a pretty amazing job. I mean, this is great for removing pimples on skin or cleaning up dust on a scanned photo or even adding clouds to a blue sky, that kind of thing. So let me zoom back out now. And let's just bring in one more element and then we'll call it done. And for this one, I'm going to use an online stock photography website called rgbstock.com. I'm going to search for some images of water waves. Now, I should have mentioned before, it's important to pay attention to copyright and licensing restrictions when you're taking online images. My pedals are one-off for personal use, so I'm not too worried about using something like a speed racer picture or that kind of thing. An image like this, which looks pretty nice, they have a, a license right here. And if you read this, it says it's okay to use for personal use, but if you're going to sell something uh, commercial using the picture, you need to get their permission. So I'm going to go ahead and save this by right-clicking on it saying Save Image As, and I'm going to save it in the same directory as my project. And I'll take it back to GIMP and say File Open. Let's open it up. I'm just going to convert the color profile. It's no problem. 
And you can see this is a pretty big picture. The image properties say that it is 300 dpi and it's about 3000 by 2000 pixels. So it should work well in our image. I'm going to go ahead and select this whole thing and copy it. So select all, edit, copy. I'm going to go back to my image and paste it in, edit, paste, as a new layer. And there it is. Now it pasted that in just above the previously selected layer, which was background, and that's perfect. That means this new waves layer is below the text labels and below the pressure gauge. And that's exactly where we want it, so it shows up behind them. Now we can select the move tool and drag this around to position it where we want it. And we can also do things to it like transform it. Let's rotate it, transform and rotate and flip it around something like, I don't know, something like that. And that'll take a second because we're working with a high resolution image. It might have been a good idea to scale it up a bit as well, but now we can position the layer where we want it. Now I'm going to do one last thing, which is to increase the size of this big text label right here. I'm going to select it and just bump it up to say 280 or maybe 300. And I'll alt click and drag it down a little bit and then back to the rectangle tool. And that looks good. Now I know I already said we were done, but let me just do one more finishing touch, which I think will help make the pedal look like a nice completed product. And that is to add a rounded black border around the edges. Let me show you how to do that. Let's right click up here and make a new layer called rectangle. And then I'm going to select all and that actually selects the entire image edge to edge. And then I'm going to shrink the selection down by about 15 or 20 pixels, or maybe let's say 25 pixels. And you see how that has reduced the size of the selection in so it's offset from the edges. Now I am going to round the edges by, this is under the select menu, selecting rounded rectangle, and just uh, round it over by 5 or 10%. And you can see now that the selection itself has rounded corners. Now nothing has been drawn yet. To do that, we want to do edit stroke selection, and we'll do it in a solid color, about 8 or 10 pixels wide, and stroke it. And there it is, a nice heavy black line. Now I've still got the selection, but you can see down here the pressure gauge and the water and everything is running to the outside of that black line, and it would be better if everything stopped at the black line. So what I'm going to do is add one more layer, last one, and call it white edge. And the selection is still in place. I'm going to invert it. What this selection encompasses is everything inside this rounded rectangle. I'm going to invert it so that it's everything outside that rounded rectangle. And then I'm just going to fill it with white. White being the current background color, I'll just say fill with background color. And you can see that it's filled that entire area outside with white. Now if I clear the selection, you can see how it looks. So there you go. That's how you use something like GIMP or Photoshop to make pedal artwork. I'll put the files from today's project up on my blog at www.planetz.com. The next step will be to print this out on a high quality inkjet printer on water slide decal paper, and then apply that water slide decal to your finished pedal. I hope this has been helpful, and thanks a lot for watching.